This is Indian Country Today. Esquili, got the, uh, thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Thalahungva. Here are the headlines for Thursday, December 10th. We are learning more about the native vote in Arizona. Enthusiasm was higher across the state in this election than in the 2016 presidential election. Indigenous voters say they were especially motivated because of the COVID-19 pandemic and issues of race. Kevin Alice, CEO of the National Congress of American Indians, says that this year Native people took their votes seriously. According to the state data, Native Americans make up at least 4.4 percent of eligible voters in Arizona, and that's more than 20, 220,000 people. And considering Arizona's presidential election was decided by 10,000 votes, the data shows the Native vote has the power to swing the outcome. Prosecutors in St. Paul, Minnesota are offering to suspend the felony charge of an American Indian movement leader. Mike Forsha is a citizen of the Bad River Band of Ojibwe. He's accused of tearing down a Christopher Columbus statue outside Minnesota's state capitol this summer. Prosecutors are asking that Forsha serve 100 hours of community service in exchange for suspending a felony charge. This was one of many statues on public grounds torn down by protesters. It was part of a nationwide reckoning over institutional racism that followed the May 25th killing of George Floyd by Minneapolis police officers. The judge in Forsha's case says the resolution is innovative and creative and also takes a step toward healing. The director of the Mississippi Choctaw Health Center says they need more face coverings. The director of public health services, Denise Benjohn, told WCBI they were hit hard by, the, by cases of coronavirus over the summer and now they need mask donations. Currently, the tribe is dealing with 30 active cases of COVID-19 and they have seen more than 13 percent of their population test positive for the virus so far. The health center is giving out packs to Choctaw citizens and they need more masks. Each pack includes two handmade cloth masks, a thermometer, and phone numbers for the Choctaw Health Center. Connecticut's two federally recognized tribes are setting aside plans for their jointly owned Tribal Winds Casino. The Mashantucket Pequot Tribal Nation and the Mohegan Tribe say they need to focus on their own casinos for now. Foxwoods Resort Casino is owned by the Pequots and Mohegan Sun is owned by the Mohegan Tribe. Both have been hit hard by the coronavirus pandemic and both were closed for nearly three months this summer. They are now operating at 25 percent capacity to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Foxwoods announced it will furlough around 100 employees, reduce gambling options and hotel capacity. Though things look bleak, tribal leaders say they are not giving up on the joint project. They've already invested $16 million in the planned gambling and com entertainment complex. Claremont Graduate University is getting one of the largest gifts in its nearly 100-year history. The San Manuel Band of Mission Indians is giving the California University $14 million to purchase the Huntley Bookstore building. It will serve as the home of the Uhave Atum Center for Health Studies. The Health Research Center is rooted in a health and well-being well initiative which was launched more than a year ago. CGU President Len Jessup says the partnership will make it possible to create responses to chronic illnesses that affect so many people. The Kaw Nation in Oklahoma and Kansas is asking for the return of a sacred prayer rock that was taken from them 90 years ago. The rock was part of a creek in an area the Kaw held sacred. The Lawrence Journal World reports the rock was removed by settlers in 1929 and placed in downtown Lawrence and set up as a monument to honor settlers. Kaw Nation Chairwoman Lynn Williams says the tribe's stewardship of the rock and its significance as a spiritual item is well documented. City officials say times have changed and are working with all parties to discuss returning the rock. And one Penobscot artist is using her vacation fund to open a, a tribal gift shop in Old Town, Maine. Maria Gerard is the Penobscot Nation's historian and she's also an artist. She's dreamed of opening up her own shop for decades. And when the pandemic forced many businesses to close, she noticed several for rent signs and decided to use her vacation fund to open a shop instead. Dawnland Handmade Creations opened the first week of December. The new store is part art studio, part gift shop, and it features handmade craft items by Native Americans. It's open on weekends and you can see more items on her Facebook page. 
And those are the headlines from Indian Country Today for Thursday, December 10th. I'm Patty Tholahungva. We'll be right back. The Oneida Nation in Wisconsin has more than 16,000 citizens, and sadly, they have lost a number of elders due to the coronavirus. And this winter, Wisconsin has seen a rise in COVID-19, so the tribe continues to ask everyone to wear face coverings and follow other CDC guidelines. Joining us today to talk about his tribe's response to this pandemic is Tehasi Hill. Welcome, Chairman Hill. Thank you. Glad to be here. So give us an update. What are the latest COVID-19 numbers for your tribe? Okay, yeah, so, you know, sadly, we have a uh, positive um, numbers, about 570 uh, total total numbers since March. Uh, approximately right now, we have approximately 30 active cases, so obviously isolation and quarantine, and we have uh, less than 10 deaths in our community at this point, but uh, more recently, most of those, the majority of those uh, deaths have been in the more recent months, so Early on, we fared, you know, fairly well with um, our recovery rate, and then um, our numbers spiked a bit last month, um, reaching uh, about 70 a week in isolation or quarantine. And then, um, of course, with the higher uh, positive rate, comes the, I guess the, the, the number of deaths also increases. Obviously, you have more, more, more people contracting the disease. You're going to have. Um, a higher death rate as well. And that's just been the case across Indian country here. Now in, uh, in um, the Green Bay area, there was a, a situation with the hospital beds and a shortage there uh, with the ICU units and the hospitals filling up. Is that still the case? We wanna make sure we're keeping uh, track of uh, the care that the hospitals provide uh, community members, not just for COVID, but other uh, issues, obviously car accidents and heart attacks and so, you know, here at Oneida, we do our best to make sure that uh, we're providing uh, opportunities uh, for our community members to um, stay safe, but also uh, uh, making sure that our activities that we provide on the in our community are done safely and have procedures in place, you know, approved by our public health officer to maintain that safety as obviously uh, trick-or-treating, Halloween, you know, Thanksgiving and coming up. Uh, Christmas and the new year. So this is kind of the holiday season and uh, we're really making sure that uh, for, you know, the health and safety of our, our community and the greater uh, community that uh, we have processes and procedures in place to um, help maintain that, that safety. And, and that's so true. There's so much to think about in terms of this um, holiday season. What is your message to your people and to all of Indian country when it comes to resisting that urge to get together during this holiday season? Yeah, you know, we've really um, messaged quite a bit uh, through this entire pandemic of obviously following the CDC guidelines of washing hands, regulatory sanitizing, social distancing, um, staying home as much as possible. You know, if you got to run to town to get groceries, you got to run to town and get groceries, but to do it as safely as possible. And uh, again, it's just a, a repeat message. And, you know, as we've gone through this, you know, coming up, getting close to nine months now, that um, uh, it's important that we heed these warnings and, and messaging as best we can as individuals and a community, because it's really both public safety. And we're not trying to infringe on anybody's personal rights or anything like that. It's really a message about public safety and uh, making sure that you keep yourself healthy, your family healthy, and ultimately uh, our community healthy. And in this whole process, you were able to um, give out uh, um, the, the BIA COVID general assistance uh, pa uh, checks for your people. Um, how did that help them out? And um, what other steps are you taking to help them through this you know, economic downturn and this hardship? Yeah, so you know, Oneida is a, a gaming tribe. So we did um, early on, uh, shut down our gaming facility for approximately 68 days, which had a very harsh uh, negative effect on our revenue and our and our budget. And so 
Uh, we did go through a, a mass layoff as well, um, reducing our workforce from about 2,700 employees down to, I believe it was right around 1,200 or 1,000 employees. So, you know, that has a very detrimental effect on our communities and our families. And so we were able to work through uh, the guidance of the, the, the COVID um, resources that we received uh, to help, you know, offset uh, uh, some of that uh, lost um, payroll for our community members, you know, and so we went through a process to um, qualify our tribal members uh, that they were affected by uh, pandemic, whether it's reduced hours or lost their job completely. Um, so we were able to provide that assistance to as a, you know, a direct payment to help them out with their mortgage or utilities, you know, food, other bills like that to help get them through this, uh, this hard time right now. And I understand you just ended a, a hunting season for your tribe. Um, and so again, is that, is, this, is subsistence living a big part of people being able to provide for their families, you know, going out to hunt and have some food for the winter time? Um, tell us about that hunt. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, historically here, we have a, a large hunting community, uh, subsistence hunting, uh, you know, deer and uh, uh, upland birds, you know, and things like that. And so, um, yeah, this year was, you know, uh, actually over the last several years, we've seen our hunting licenses for our tribal members and uh, increase over the years. And so I know we're pretty close to approaching you know, a thousand licenses sold. Um, that's quite significant for us because our reservation isn't really that large, um, especially compared to some of the Western tribes. Uh, we're only about 65,400 acres to which we own about, you know, about, I believe it was 30, 35% of the reservation. So approximately, you know, 20,000 acres. So um, it's, it gets kind of crowded during the during the, the deer gun season. And so um, uh, I'm glad to, you know, be able to report that our hunting seasons for many, many years have been uh, very safe and we haven't had any hunting accidents. It's probably more than probably 15 or 20 years ago was probably our last uh, kind of significant hunting accident. And so that's important. And then that, um, again, you know, that, uh, that wild game is a healthier, healthier food than you can, for the most part, buy in stores locally. And so we've been on a path of encouraging our tribal members to increase their health. So getting outside and exercising and eating more healthy, and you can hit two of those, those two targets by getting, you know, getting out to the woods and uh, walking around and harvesting some um, wild game. And I understand you also have a traditional foods grocery store. And um, so is that all integrated together in really trying to get back to an indigenous diet? Yeah, definitely. So there's, you know, several branches of being able to get back to indigenous diet. Uh, we've encouraged over the years for community members to obviously to start their own gardens and um, grow our heirloom white corn. And we're really glad to see, you know, a couple of co-ops kind of uh, Bring up over the last couple of years, uh, being able to provide uh, alternative nutritious um, produce. And uh, part of that also is obviously our Oneida market, where um, some of the products that we provide, uh, you know, the uh, black Angus beef, the grass fed buffalo, our apple orchard, um, things like that, be able to provide in the market to our community at large. And then also our, from our products from our organic um, farm called Junhequa. And so they do things like um, chicken and other produce and the white corn as well, and uh, traditional medicines and growing our traditional tobacco as well on that, that um, operation. And so we try to provide, I guess, as much as we can for our community, but also providing that education goes a long way as well to wanting to get people to Take the initiative to grow some of their own food and so i think that's an important aspect of our our culture and our health and our our mental well-being as well you know getting out there and getting your hands dirty in the garden uh, provides some you know some exercise and uh, kind of break up the monotony of going to work every day sitting in an office and going home and sitting on the couch so you know increasing that activity level is also important 
Absolutely. Is there a, a word in your language that could describe this pandemic, the situation that we're in right now? Um, I'm sure there is, um, but I'm not as fluent as I would like to be. And so I, I definitely wouldn't want to try. But, you know, as we go through this, you know, we've relied heavily on our our, our cultural um, people for providing those, those prayers and tobacco burnings and uh, trying to fulfill our ceremonial duties to the best of our ability at this point with social distancing that also makes it difficult for our normal gathering for our ceremonies. And so, you know, our, 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 our leaders, our cultural traditional leaders, you know, have taken that upon themselves to do that with obviously a very small group and still, you know, conduct those ceremonies as best they can at this point in this pandemic. Chairman Hill, tell me how your other enterprises are doing. Uh, we have, uh, as a part of our gaming facility, uh, a Radisson Hotel and Conference Center. And as across the country, the, the numbers have been uh, very terrible. Um, a lot of business uh, conferences and things like that all you know canceled out, weddings canceled. So, you know, we have like a 400 room operation. And during the week, you could have single digit occupancy and then need um, on a weekend now, maybe a hundred rooms out of that 400 rooms when normally on a weekend you're, you know, three quarters booked, but so that's a very devastating effect to our, our hospitality industry. And especially since we just went through major renovations over the last few years of both the conference halls and then uh, just this spring completed the uh, room re renovations and lobby renovations and new restaurant and things like that. So, you know, when it's going to be a little bit difficult when, you know, trying to figure out when the bills come due for, you know, obviously the financing for getting that done, that's uh, something we're going to continue to work through. Um, but other things like our bank as well have uh, fared actually pretty well. Uh, rates were low and so it still spurred a, actually a lot of home buying in our in our area here and still a lot of you know automotive loans um, and personal loans we just had to report I believe it was last month from our, our bank president and um, he's really hopeful that uh, the continued growth of the bank uh, for the next few years at least. And um, since you're not able to gather together in person, how is that impacting your tribal council meetings? Are you having uh, your business uh, committee meetings online? Um, we still have them in person. Uh, we just recently passed a, a process um, so that we can hold them virtually because you know, uh, as we follow our our previous tribal laws and ordinances, it was, you know, must be present at the meeting. So we had to make some changes to allow for virtual meetings, so that just happened. Um, but generally, we've held them obviously in, a, in a, our large council chambers, uh, socially distanced. So we each had our own essential table set up in the room, and um, me meeting via Teams, uh, Microsoft Teams, to have those meetings and and uh, have the presentations from outside of. From within the organization, but outside of the room, so that um, we can maintain the low numbers in a in a workspace, and maintain that social distancing, and uh, everything's wiped down pretty regularly. We uh, require masks when you're outside of your own office, and if you go to visit someone in their office, you have to wear a mask. And so, you know, we put a lot of safety procedures in place. Well, that's that's really good. Yeah. So what about the kids? You know, um, you're, you're, you and your wife together have nine children. Um, so as a father, understanding the holidays and how important they are, this coming weekend, you have a drive uh, through uh, event with Santa. I think it's a breakfast to go or something. Yeah. So, you know, norm, under normal circumstances, we would have breakfast with Santa at one of our recreation centers and invite, you know, families to come in and share a meal and, you know, take a picture with Santa and receive, you know, some, uh, some gifts. Um, but, you know, obviously with the pandemic, we, uh, our operations work with the public health to make sure that they could still provide an opportunity for the children and families in our communities and do a drive through pickup breakfast and, um, and very similar to the trick or treating as well. It was kind of more of a, 
a, a drive-through operation for our community to have a, a safe opportunity to still have the kids dress up in their costumes and, and uh, have a little bit of normalcy uh, for the holiday. And, and coming up with creative ways to continue to have the kids have some kind of celebration. So as you mentioned, keeping things somewhat normal there. Um, Chairman Dehasi Hill, thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome, glad to be here. And when we come back, we're going to hear about the re repatriation efforts by the Seminole Tribe in Florida. After years of meetings and the passage of two resolutions, both sponsored by the Repatriation Committee of the Seminole Tribe of Florida, the remains of ancestors and sacred objects will finally be returned to the Seminoles. Sandra Schulman is a freelance journalist and she joins us now to talk about the story she wrote for Indian Country Today called Big Win in No More Stolen Ancestors Fight. Welcome, Sandra. Hi, thank you, Patty. Well, Sandra, describe this new policy and how it came about because it's been years before you know before this finally uh, happened. Well, it's a it's a story that goes back a long time. They they were uh, over years of, of donations and acquisitions. Remains were being pulled out of Florida and given over to the Natural History Museum and the Smithsonian. About eight years ago, now the Seminoles were only recognized as a tribe in '57 and the Miccosukee in 62. So they were saying that these remains had to be part of their ancestors, but then the Smithsonian and the museum were saying they're culturally unidentifiable because they're so old. So eight years of meetings, um, a big contingent from the Seminoles, including Tina Osceola, she really led the charge. She was the former head of the Atatiki Museum, which is a Seminole history museum. They kept going to Washington and meeting with the Smithsonian eight years it took. And they even withdrew their Smithsonian affiliation of the museum, which is a very big deal. It's very difficult to get that and it's very prestigious. So they withdrew their affiliation, years of meetings. And I had done a story in April that wrote about this. They had just come from a big meeting that a decision was imminent and the decision came through recently that they did win. So what changed at the National Museum of Natural History to make this new policy happen? I think it was a matter of, of logic and compassion in a lot of ways. You can't, you can't take these bones from where a tribe has been from thousands of years and say they don't belong to the tribe. It just doesn't make sense. In addition, the tribe is also presenting forensic evidence. They were digging up dirt where they knew their ancestors were bringing it, it matched the dirt that the Smithsonian and the museum had. So I think all of these things put together, you know, perhaps a new wave of um, realizing that, you know, bones and ancestors are not for display and not for, you know, sitting in a box in a museum that doesn't give any rest or peace or dignity to a tribe and to their history and their ancestors. Now you wrote that the um, museum has something like 6,000 individuals, uh, 200,000 funerary objects, 55 sacred objects. That's the kind of collection we're talking about. And um, remains, yes, to funerary objects as well. Yes, and so, um, so when the Seminoles started asking for those remains back and the funerary objects, um, what part of um, their social media campaign do you think helped create this new policy and change the minds of the museum people? They created a hashtag called No More Stolen Ancestors, uh, which they spread all over the place. I first heard about this um, last year at the big Seminole powwow and fair that they hold in Hollywood, Florida at the new Guitar Hotel. They had a big banner um, of No More Stolen Ancestors and it was showing giving the reasons of what was going on. They were withdrawing from the Smithsonian and they were, you know, leading the charge in this fight. So that was the first I'd heard of it, but I followed up on it and uh, got in touch with all the major people there. I got statements from the museum. So that's really how they were bringing it to social media and making people more aware of what was going on. Now, the other big thing about this win is this is not just for the Seminoles. This extends to all the U.S. tribes, including Alaska and Hawaii. So all of them now can go in and claim back these objects. 
That, and that's huge. Again, um, you know, the, the and it's not just the Seminoles. No. Yes. And um, again, this is uh, also covered under NAGPRA, the Native American Graves and uh, Repatriation Protection Act there. So we're looking at how that's going to be implemented and again, how tribes can go in and, um, and have these remains uh, returned, repatriated to tribes. It's a sweeping policy for all tribes in the North American continent. And again, we want to remind everyone that you can read Sandra's story on our website. Uh, the name of her story is Big Win in No More Stolen Ancestors Fight. Sandra Schulman, thank you so much for joining us today. There's a link in the story to the actual new policy that can be downloaded. Oh, good. Okay. Well, we can look for that as well. All right. Thank you, Sandra, for joining us. Thank you so much, Patty. And thank you for watching. Take care of yourselves. Your life is precious. I'm Patty Tholhungva. Join us again tomorrow. Indian Country Today is recorded at the Phoenix Indian School Visitor Center in Phoenix, Arizona. This is Indian Country Today.